Hi everyone, my name is Alex Krotz and today I want to show you a simple project that I've been working on recently, uh, which is to make a simple physics engine in Mathematica for the simulation of classical particles. Um, something I was particularly interested in is uh, simulating classical particles in collision with boundaries. And so I figured out a simple way of doing that that has reasonably good energy convergence and looks pretty realistic in terms of its dynamical properties. Um, the first sort of type of project, or rather the first type of simulation is uh, one where we have a box of particles and then I have a boundary that goes halfway up the box. There's a gravitational field. Uh, the mass of the particles is unity. And then the energy of the particles in the initial positions are sampled randomly from Boltzmann distribution uh, to allow me to get sort of a temperature dependent sampling. I define functions that determine if the position of a particle is past a boundary. And if it is, it appropriately modifies the momentum of the particle to give the corresponding reflection. In this case, it's super simple because all of the boundaries are either vertical or horizontal. And so the uh, change in the momentum is just a difference in sign of one of the two axes. And this is a two-dimensional simulation, so I can initialize those. Uh, the, dis the sampling of the particles is sort of arbitrary at this point. It's really just using the temperature as a uh, sort of a proxy to the energy distribution of the particles. And if we start the simulation, you can see that the particles start to bounce around. And then every now and then, some of the particles with a little bit of a higher energy will make their way over to the right-hand side of the box. Uh, then it dynamically updates a histogram to show how the sort of ensemble of particles can pass over the barrier, even though the height of the barrier in terms of potential energy is higher than the mean energy of the particles. Uh, that's not so much the case really because the gravitational constant in this simulation is so high, um, but really it starts out with enough kinetic energy. And then if it's initialized at a high enough random position, then it'll have enough energy to make its way over the barrier. So it's not quite accurate to a thermal distribution, but it's close enough to reasonably approximate some of the temperature dependent effects. For instance, if I look at the total number of particles that's on the right-hand side of the box, all of the particles are initialized in the left-hand side of the box. And so if I plot the ratio of the particles that are on the right versus the total number of particles, then as the temperature goes to infinity, I should see that ratio approaching 50%. And so I've done that for a number of temperatures here. Uh, you can see five temperature units. It's sort of arbitrary at this point. But as we increase the temperature, both the rate of particle crossing over to the right-hand side of the box, as well as the uh, average um, thermalized number of particles on the right-hand side of the box uh, starts to approach 50%. and never quite reaches it because that's the infinite temperature limit. And at infinite temperature, uh, the velocities of the particle will start to get a bit too high. And so you have to decrease the time step a lot and it becomes less efficient to calculate. The way that the simulation is updated is by solving just Hamilton's equations of motion uh, with a gravitational force term uh, using a, I guess in this case, it's just whatever default the solver chooses for ND solved value. Uh, generally, I would use an explicit runge Kuda solver. Um, and so it solves the differential equations num numerically and then evaluates P and Q at that time step. Um, and then there's just a simple loop that enforces the different barriers or the boundary conditions. Uh, and then I take measurements of the energy and then uh, also the ratio of the particles on each side of the boundary. A slightly more interesting simulation is done with a similar framework. Let me reinitialize the kernel. But in this case, I have a bunch of circular boundaries as well as a non-ideal like elasticity. 
So this parameter F gives the percentage of energy that is transferred when a particle hits a boundary. Um, the circle boundaries were a bit challenging to figure out, but by using the built-in reflection matrix function, you can solve for the matrix that reflects a vector, which in this case is the momentum about the vector between the particle that is now inside the circular boundary and the center of the circular boundary, which gives in for any direction and for any momentum what the corresponding bouncing angle is, or rather the momentum corresponding to the right bouncing angle. Uh, and then it shifts the position of the particle to the edge of the boundary. That's one of the key issues with the simulation in that if your time step is too big and your particle jumps inside the boundary, it will not conserve energy because you're moving the position against the gravitational field, but the kinetic energy of the particle is still conserved. Um, and so the simulation range looks like a, let me just run things for a second. Here, the particles are all sampled um, just in a random region of the simulation uh, and with zero momentum initially. So, let's see. so this is the simulation. You can see all of the circular boundaries and then the red particles. This is what is known as a Galton board. Um, the idea here is that by having small, small random deviations in the position of the particles to begin with, even though we, we drop them down from rather similar positions in the board, they form a normal distribution as you collect statistics on which of these slots they come out of. And that's what this histogram is showing. Um, so really quickly, if we run the simulation, you can see the particles are falling. In this case, I think it's about 30 particles. Uh, it gets a lot more interesting when you increase the number of particles. Uh, now you can collect statistics over many independent samples because the particles are not interacting. So as long as your distribution of initial conditions is the same, you can just combine multiple simulation runs. Uh, but you can also, if you're not dynamically updating the graphics, then the simulation runs a lot faster. And so if you just save the graphics instead of updating to the screen, you can generate little movies. And so that's what I've done. Uh, let me open those. So here you can see, so this is for 3,000 particles with a 75% um, elasticity coefficient. You can see the distribution approximates a normal distribution. And they all tend to fall down pretty fast. Uh, if we do totally ideal bounces, then we get a much broader distribution. And this is again with 3000 particles. So it takes quite a while to generate these. Um, and I found that the most difficulty that I have is when they're bouncing inside the confined regions of the simulation because they have a rather high velocity since the energy is conserved. And that makes it appear kind of non-physical, uh, but that doesn't really affect the outcome too much. And by that, I just mean that it, it appears that the particles are going inside the boundary when the reality is they're only there for a small, for a single time step and then they're moved out. Um, let's watch that again. So yeah, you can see these particles appear that they're inside the boundary, but really they're just moving fast enough that a single time step move them inside the boundary and the next time step they'll be out in the corresponding angle or uh, moving in the corresponding direction with only a slight change in the energy due to the uh, arbitrary movement against the gravitational field. And then we can see for 1500 particles, this is with a 90% elasticity coefficient. You can see we get a slightly narrower than the 100%, but also slightly broader than the 75% uh, simulation. So 
so yeah, I was surprised how well the uh, ND solve value function works. As you can see, I just define uh, sort of vector functions by initializing these P and Q functions at sort of an, uh, a vector that describes the X and Y coordinates of any number of points. As I said, I've done it up to 3000 points and it can solve the values quite quickly. I think uh, I tried it with the SciPy um, linear algebra solver, and this seems slightly faster. I didn't do a formal test of which one was faster, but this one suits the purposes and the graphics are built in. So can't really beat that if you're just having fun. Um, okay, thanks for watching. I, I'll probably put some variant of these notebooks in a Google Drive and share it in the description of the video. So if you want to run it, you can feel free to try it yourself. Thanks for watching. Bye.